So last lesson, we were looking at a few things relating to the energy topic. It was We first went over the idea that there are energy can be in different forms. Uh, so you've got kinetic, chemical, elastic, thermal, electrical, gravitational, light, or electromagnetic, sound energy, nuclear energy, magnetic energy. And then I said that some of these energies are what we call potential energies. Now, that means that they have the potential to do something. They might just not, they might, there, there might not be any evidence that, that the object has any energy um, in most cases, but it has the potential to turn into something else. And, and that energy will be stored for however long it is needed. So chemical energy, if something has chemical energy, like a piece of wood, piece of wood doesn't really look like it's got any energy, but we know that you can turn it into heat and light by setting it on fire. You get, you get a, a tiny little bit of heat from a, from a match. Uh, you can eventually you know, release a lot of energy from a lot of wood. So clearly there's energy trapped inside that wood in the first place. And the type of energy that is, is called chemical energy. So if the energy is kind of held within something and can be unlocked if you know how to then we can say that's potential energy so other forms of potential energies are elastic energy like on this mouse trap you've got this energy trapped or held and stored within this spring um, what's worth mentioning with elastic energy is if it isn't stretched or squashed it doesn't have elastic energy so a spring on its own it's not storing any elastic energy unless it's actually stre stretched or squashed. A bag of springs that you buy from the shop on, do not contain any elastic energy. However, if you picked one up and then stretched it, that one contains elastic energy. Uh, gravitational, if something is lifted up, it gains gravitational energy. One of the things that we said about gravitational energy is that um, you can't really ever say that something has no gravitational energy or it does it has energy or not, it's more that it gains or loses gravitational energy. And the reason for that is because, let's say a ball is on a shelf, we can say, oh, that ball has gravitational energy. When it falls to the floor, it doesn't have gravitational energy. Maybe the gravitational energy was turned into kinetic and then eventually into heat and sound as it hits the floor. But but then if, you, if it turns out that actually you were, on, you were in a first floor flat and then it rolled off and then fell somehow off the, out of the windowsill and out of the flat, then you can say, oh, it turns out actually it did have gravitational energy because I forgot that I was in the first floor flat. So then it falls to the floor and then it rolls a little bit further and falls down a drain. And you go, oh, it still had gravitational energy then too. So the point is, it never really stops unless actually, if you, if you think about this more and more, the only place it would ever really stop is if it actually, if you drilled a hole to the core of the Earth and it went to the core of the Earth. And only at that very, it's the center of our planet, would it not have any further to fall? Because the point is, with when things are falling due to gravity, is they're trying to get towards the center of the planet. Um, where you can think about all the mass of a planet is being held in a way. So that obviously that doesn't really happen. So we just say an increase or decrease in gravitational energy. Uh, and then you've got nuclear energy. So you can have nuclear fuel, which is uh, a type of uh, fuel that you did study um, in another topic when you were looking at radioactivity and nuclear fission. Uh, where a fuel, it's very similar to, it can be thought of in a very similar way to chemical energy. It's not chemical energy, but it can be thought of as in a similar way uh, because you've got this kind of fuel which has an energy trapped within it. And once you release that energy, it, well, it, it can be converted into something else. Uh, the other ones aren't potential. You can't store heat energy. Um, one, something, when something is hot, it just, gives a heat energy out, whether you want it to or not. And then other things can absorb that heat energy and then give it out as well and so on. Uh, electrical energy is a way of um, transporting energy along a wire or through anything that conducts electricity. And you've got light, light, uh, light or uh, energy or sound energy works in a similar way to thermal energy. And they just give it out whenever something is um, 
lit up or whenever something's making sound, it, it gives out the sound energy. Uh, magnetic energy, we didn't really talk about too much because it doesn't really come up at GCSE and I can't remember much about it anyway. So if we see a question on it, then we'll, <laughs> if we see a question on it, we'll do a bit more about it then. Um, a good, I guess when you pick these um, energy types apart a little bit, you might realize that, well, actually sound energy is just like kinetic energy because what is sound? Sound is just vibration. If something's uh, vibrating back and forth, then it's got then it's making sound that's what sound is it, it, uh, you know if you um in case you didn't know that like you may you may have learned this from learning about sound if you if you look at a speaker if you video a speaker with a really good quality camera and um, that's making some sound and then you watch the video and slow it right down you'll see the speaker cone is moving back and forth and if it makes a high pitch sound, it moves back and forth quickly. If it makes a low pitch sound, it moves less quickly, less frequently, which is why we call it, use the word frequency. Um, so we can say sound is actually a time for kinetic energy, but usually it's taught, thought of as in a different way. In the same way, thermal energy could be thought of as kinetic energy because it's really, it, well, maybe not quite, but it, to, in some levels, you can think about it as how fast the particles are moving. So in a solid, if a solid is hot, then the particles are vibrating quickly. If a liquid is hot, the particles are moving around quickly and same with the gas. However, again, it's thought of as something different um, than, uh, than kinetic energy. So kinetic energy is more when something is, the whole thing is moving in one go, right? All the particles, so you've got a, a ball has kinetic energy. The ball is moving as one thing in what in you know uh, all together as opposed to each individual particle that makes up the ball we're talking about the whole object as having as moving okay does that, all that make sense so we then talked about how one type of energy can be converted or transferred into another type of energy for example this electric motor is designed to convert electrical energy into kinetic energy um, now it may be designed to do that, but we, because it's impossible to make anything perfect, it um, also produces a bit of heat because there's friction within the motor. Um, and there's also resistance in the wires, so the wires will get hot too. So whenever you um, have a machine or anything that is converting energy um, or transferring energy, then you're going to have a useful output and a wasted output. So this, uh, we call this one a wasted output. The red one is wasted and then the green one is useful. Obviously, we want to make less of the wasted and more of the useful. And the more we do of that, the more efficient something is. And that's what we're going to be looking a little bit more at today, efficiency. So if something makes a lot of kinetic energy, if a motor makes a lot of kinetic energy, and not much thermal energy, we can say the motor is efficient. Okay, does that make sense? And then we've got, and then we've got the input energy, of course, the energy that we started off with. That was the energy that we changed into something else. So that's the motor. This is an example of a light bulb. Again, thermal is being wasted. Um, if if you're a little bit stuck on an exam question, you had to identify which is the wasted energy. Nine times out of ten, it's thermal. Occasionally, it's also sound, um, but there are going to be some cases when thermal isn't wasted. So you just got to ask yourself: Is the machine trying to make heat? Like, so a hair dryer, well, that is trying to make heat. So um, a hair dryer, you're going to have electrical energy again because you plug it into wall to get electricity so using electrical energy, and you're going to convert that into um, heat. Um, and kinetic energy so because you've got this fan whizzing around that's blasting the hot, hot air and to dry your hair, but it's also making sound. So the sound energy would be the wasted energy in that case. Um, you also, when they want to make it a bit more complicated, they can separate the energies so you can have two thermal energies. So you can have the thermal energy that's used to, design, to dry your hair and the other thermal energy that's just, it, it, um, just radiated, just emitted out to the environment because of the hot motor. So that type of thermal energy, that would be wasted, whereas the energy you use to dry your hair isn't wasted. So you can see how they can complicate things a little bit if they wanted to, but you get the general principle. Um, so then we looked at Sankey diagrams and we briefly touched upon 
what a Sankey diagram is. We said that the wider this arrow is, the more the energy it represents. So if, for example, and this bit I think is maybe new, we might not have talked about this before. And this isn't a very good diagram, actually, but I think I did it in a bit of a rush. So let's say that that was, I measured that with a ruler to be eight centimeters then uh, you can see that clearly these can't be right. And you'll see in a, me a moment why. If that's eight centimetres, then one centimetre must be um, using the same scale would represent 100 joules. So therefore, this 100 joules must be one centimetre. 150 would be 1.5 centimetres. And this one should be five and a half. And it doesn't really look like it's much larger than 1.5, does it? So so that can't be right, can it? But that's um, how you would do a Sankey diagram accurately. Um, we also talked about the conservation of energy, the, the idea that no energy can be created or destroyed. It can only be transformed from one to another. So let's just take an example here. Um, we will take the light bulb, I think, um, and just copy that and put it down here. So, in fact, we I, I applied this conservation of energy above as well. Like, so if we've got 800 going in, 150 coming out as kinetic and 100 as heat, the rest of it, the other 550 must have come out as sound. The, when you add the outputs together, they must add up to the inputs because otherwise we've either created or destroyed energy and you can't do that. Um, so a similar way, let's say that um, <clears throat> we have... Hmm, um, let's say 180 joules of light. Actually, that would never happen. Let's make it a bit more precise. 180 joules of thermal and 20 joules of light. So these light bulbs are not actually that efficient, are they? The total amount of electrical energy that put in must have been 200 joules. Okay, so... Um, I'm going to pause the video. I'm just just for pause the video. The question is, how efficient is this light bulb, or in other words, how good is it? I suppose at making light. Um, if you if you gave it a percentage, what percentage would you give it? So, if it was 100 percent efficient, and in other words, it's perfect. So, it, it, what is it trying to do? It's trying to make light energy. So. At the moment, this one isn't perfect. It's actually only made 20 joules of light energy out of the 200 that was given. The rest of it was turned into thermal. Um, but in a, if it was a perfect light bulb, it would actually produce um, 200 joules of electrical. And if it did that, there wouldn't be left any, anything left over to make uh, thermal energy. And so it's, uh, yeah, it would be 200, 200. Now, how would that look like as a Sankey diagram? Well, um, a lot of people get stuck on this, actually, but that's because it's kind of a weird diagram. It would just look like that. <laughs> It'd just be a plain arrow because there's only one energy coming in, one energy going out. So therefore, there's the same width. So we got we would have, in this case, if it was a perfect light bulb, 200 joules of electrical and um, and 200 joules of uh, of light energy coming out okay now so what about if it was 50 percent efficient how many joules of light would it make in that case yeah that's right so half of it would be converted in that case so you'd get 200 to um to 100 and then the rest and then how much how much thermal energy would be produced Yeah, so if it was 50% um, efficient, you'd get 200 going in of electrical, and then you get 100 of light and 100 of, um, of thermal energy. Let's imagine what that would look like. I'm going to draw a rectangle first for the sort of input part. So that'll be my... I'm going to actually... No, I won't. I'll, I'll leave the borders there. Um, and I'm going to get an arrow here. And this is going to... This needs to be about um, half... As wide right so the, the width of that arrow needs to be about half as wide and then that so we can actually write on the right on the shape actually so that will be our 
uh, 100 joules of light. Um, and, and then we're going to have, a. this is going to be 100 joules of heat, heat energy. And we rotate it like that and put it there. And there we have a Sankey diagram for something 50% efficient. So we'll just make sure that we save 200 joules um, <clears throat> electrical going in. Okay. There's our Sankey diagram of 50% of, um, efficient. Now we've got, let's go back to the original one. And can you work out how efficient this one is? Okay, so you so yeah, ten percent efficient. So you've just managed to give me the efficiency of this light bulb without me teaching you the formula. So which is good. So I think it's always important to try to understand the um, understand the uh, the concepts without using the formula uh, because it means you're more you know you don't have to rely on memorizing the formula. But I will now teach you the formula as well. Um, so efficiency can be calculated like this. And obviously you'll see that in every case we get the same answer. So let me just zoom in a little bit there. Uh, so efficiency is going to be equal to the useful, the useful output energy. I'll just put useful output because that's usually how it's written and also gives me space to write something else here. So useful output divided by the total input. So sometimes we might somehow manage to put in more than one energy as an input, but most of the time not. So total input, we've got, in that case, it was 200 inputs and we had uh, 20 as the output. Then, you, then if you want to turn it into a percentage, you then times it by 100%. Otherwise, you'll leave it as a decimal. So in the example, the one, the original one, we had 20 joules of, of the input divided by the 200 joules of the output. And that would be equal just to 0 0.1. That's fine. You can write that as the, uh, as the efficiency. And they often want you to write it as a percentage. So if you then times that by 100, you get 10 and it would be 10%. Okay. That makes sense. So efficiency is nothing more than that, really. Uh, and you can see how it links with Sankey diagrams. Uh, so yeah, I'll just stop the video there and we'll save that.